Okay, so this evening we'll uh, go forward on to our path to developing uh, web applications with Python. And I already uh, discussed uh, on last week uh, uh, the main concept about the session. Uh, so we saw how a web application can somehow uh, remember some information given by the user. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still missing one point is uh, how can we forget about that? So for example, if you remember, uh, yeah, um, we had uh, this web application. Okay, let's start it again. And uh, the application allowed the user to enter any name. my name, and this name was used uh, for some internal cal calculations, but especially it was remembered even in future interactions. So right now, the, thanks to the cookie mechanism that were exchanged uh, between the server and the browser, the browser is storing some data that the server can use uh, to recover the name uh, and maybe other information about the user. The only piece of uh, uh, functionality that is missing is how to sort of log out from this uh, uh, situation. So what if we want to go back uh, to a web server that doesn't know hmm, about uh, this user so that another user can, let's say, log in or provide their information? Hmm? Uh, actually, it's quite easy. For providing a logout function, we need to define a new page where we destroy the information that is inside the session collection. Remember, the session is actually a, collection, um, a dictionary in Python. So we just have to clear that dictionary, so emptying the dictionary from all the data that is inside. The, to do that, we, now, we must allow the user uh, to access the point, to request this uh, logout option. And for doing that, we, we have to modify the home page in this case. So, for example, we go back to the home page code, and we see that maybe we try to reformat it a bit. Okay. We see that uh, the web page okay, shows the title and uh, the heading on the top, and then it, the page will follow different paths, different execution paths, depending on the presence or not uh, of the username key into the session dictionary. So if a username is defined into the session, then uh, it writes, is welcome back. If the username is not defined, then it will provide the input uh, form hmm, for the user. So what we have to do here is just to add uh, a second uh, uh, link here with the text logout, so that the user, if, if he's logging, if he's, if, it, if he's being recognized, then he can log out, he can forget, he can access the website to forget about himself. And for doing that, we need to define another page, which will be just a service page uh, for processing this uh, logout request. So we know now that every time we need to create a link, uh, we must uh, uh, dynamically generate the, the, the address for that page. So it will be a page called Logout. That uh, would be the destination of, uh, uh, of your uh, page, hmm? of your request, Logout request. So we need uh, to add a new page into the main application here. Okay, so I created a link called logout that will call a page that we call logout, a function. And so we define this function somewhere here. Of course, we have to route to any address, visible address, external address. Maybe this would be sufficient. 
and define logout as the function name. Function name, remember, is also the page name. So this logout name should match this logout uh, argument. Okay, so at this point we, we are sure that the session is initialized uh, because otherwise uh, we wouldn't have generated this code in the first place if the session was not initialized with a valid username. What we have to do is just to clear the username. So session dot clear. And this would get rid of all the objects stored in the dictionary, actually for that specific user. Remember that this dictionary is personalized, is customized for every user accessing the website at this time. Okay, and then, and then uh, usually a web page should return an HTML content. But what content do we need to return right now? Uh, so remember, we are here, we have a logout button down in the back here. We are clicking logout. So what kind of page are you expecting to see after logout? Well, I would expect uh, a new clean login page, a new home page. So in theory, we should here render the template uh, home. So do the same operation that we did, that we did here. <coughs> So this is what we could do. Render template, home.html. At this point, the home template should show the form again. So let's try. We, we are remember the cookie, if I log out, wrong with you or with me try that okay stop it okay look out So a user can log in, and then coming back to the home page, it could log out. So we are storing information in the session. It will remember until we clear the session, or until the cookie expires. So the session will set a cookie with a, an expiration of 20 or 30 minutes, more or less. Hmm? Um, the bad part about this is uh, this address up there. You see that we are on the home page, but the address reads logout. I don't like it very much because the home page address should be this one, the root page. So it's not nice having in different pages, different URLs, different external addresses presenting the same content. Actually, the home page is being presented both by, is being published both at the root address and at the logout address. So it would be nicer to tell the browser, uh, dear browser, I'm done with this page. We don't need to provide a template, just uh, send the user to the home page at this point. Uh, I, this uh, uh, specific page, the logout page, doesn't have to show anything to the user. It only does some internal bookkeeping, so deleting the objects, and then needs uh, to redirect the user to the home page. This can be done quite easily, thanks to a redirect method. So inside a method, you can, inside a page, you can either return a page, so a template, you can render a template and render, uh, return the full HTML, or return a redirect comment, 
which is a special header in the HTTP protocol that will tell the browser, please reload this new page. So the browser will see the response and immediately, without asking, will create a new HTTP request for the address that you're specifying here. So that will be transparent to the user, and the user will see the final address in the uh, browser bar, hmm, which is cleaner. So we just have to import, of course, the redirect function, and then we return redirect URL for that was called home, wasn't it? No, uh, yes, home. Always the name of the function. So the external behavior here is the same. We enter a name. The name is remembered. We go back to the home page. Have a look at the address bar. If I log out, the logout uh, URL doesn't show up here. Probably it did show for some microsecond uh, while the, the browser were requesting that, but instead of, of getting uh, an HTML page, it got a, a, a redirect request uh, and it was immediately executed by the browser that asked the web page again. So every time you have to jump from one page to another, uh, the cleanest way to do that is of redirecting the request. So this is the basic mechanism for, let's say, user management, logging in and out of the users. Actually, we are not really logging in because the only login that we do is uh, just storing the name. Okay, because we don't have any password to validate. In a real login, we should also ask for a password and check with the database whether the username and password pair is valid. So we'll... we'll We'll join the, the database later. But without the database, we cannot validate any, anything. Okay? Okay. So this is something functional, even if a bit ugly to see. No? It's uh, all uh, old stylish, so on. So what we are doing today, we are trying to learn something about uh, making websites more nice to see, making a uh, more complete and captivating layout, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we will try to have a, a crash course at uh, style sheets uh, in the web. So let me stop that file. Mm -hmm. So uh, HTML renders with a set of default styles. You see that uh, the H1 title is in this uh, font size, colored black, uh, times font. It's a serif font. Uh, all the body text uh, is, uh, comes with this font, colored black, and so on. Hmm? Um, actually, this is only the default possibility. If you don't specify anything more, the browser will apply some default styles to the HTML content that we provide. Uh, every browser, every modern browser, already has uh, some internal uh, mechanism for applying different styles to the content of the page. Styles could be colors, could be spacing, could be backgrounds, uh, could be fonts, could be layout, positioning. So everything that you could do to transform a say, linear black and white piece of text uh, with uh, one boring font into a, a full and nice page that we are accustomed to navigate today. And this is done with a, an additional language, which is called the CSS. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. So we are taking the content in the HTML page and applying a style sheet onto that. So we are redefining the style, the visual style, in which every element of the, pa this, the page is rendered. Cascading State Sheet is, a, is an old, uh, let's say, uh, language recommendation. It's an old format. It dates back to 96. It's 20 years old. Uh, recently, we, are, we entered uh, the, 
the level three, no? the third revision of the style sheets, which is still an ongoing work because uh, the, the, mm, the, the revision three was quite ambitious and was trying to do a lot with CSS, not just styling fonts and measurements and colors, but also animations uh, and some sort of interaction and so on. So um, some part of it are, still are already you know, well established, some are still uh, ongoing, but we can use them, uh, the, the, the main ones are, 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 are already defined. So what is the idea behind uh, CSS? Well, we are in the web, so you can guess that uh, also CSS is built with the web philosophy in mind, uh, name, value. So we apply a value to a name, to a code. A CSS is based, a CSS file or CSS document is essentially a set of rules. So a style sheet is a set of style rules. Every rule, so imagine many rules, one per row, in the file, in a text file, every rule is made of two parts, a selector and a statement made of declarations. So a selector and some declarations. Declarations, plural, because it's in uh, braces and you can have more than one. All the declarations apply to the same selector. This means wherever in the HTML you find an element that matches the selector, in this case H1, so it's a heading on level one, title in the, in the page, then apply the declarations to this element. And what is a declaration? It's a, a property value pair. So change the property called color into the value blue of what? Of this element, or the HTML element matching the selector. Change the font size property to the value 12 pixels. So we have a set of uh, declarations are applying a value to a property. And the selector will specify to which elements these declarations are applied. So in this case, in our web page, if we apply this selector, this, this CSS rule, the home page title will become blue and smaller because with 12 pixels now, now, right now it's something like 18 probably. The text will stay black because we are not applying any style rule onto the text because the text is into a P paragraph and is not included into an H1 uh, heading. Uh, remember, the home page is in uh, H1. And so the content of this the H1 selector will select this part of the page and will apply these uh, properties to that content. By the way, the, this content is some text and also an image. The CSS will try to apply this property to all the content. Of course, an image doesn't have a font size property, so that will be ignored. The in, an image doesn't have a color property, so that will be ignored. And this property will only be applied where it makes sense, so to the text. So actually, we take a selector, we I, through a selector, we identify a part of the page, of the web page, and we apply to all the elements in that part of the, of the, of the page uh, some property change when they apply, because in some elements they could apply, in some they couldn't apply. This is the general mechanism. Of course, uh, HTML should be seen as a tree. So we know we write it in text format with nested tags. Uh, so every tag uh, sort of contains other tags and so on. So if you apply something at the tag level, a rule, a CSS rule that will apply to this table element, then it will apply to all the tables behind it. If you apply something to a TR, table row element, it will apply to all these subtree, 
and to all the subtree and to all the subtree and so on. so all the table role elements and their siblings their descendants hmm? so a selector is quite a powerful we, we see it. there is a syntax for selectors there will be a syntax for declarations but we always have these two-step application first we have the HTML the selector will highlight some of the nodes and then on those nodes we will change one by one the properties that is how we see the CSS working um, of course uh, there might be the case there might be the case where more rules uh, match the same elements. So imagine we are defining a rule uh, body color green. So we are matching the body element. It means that it applies to all the HTML document, every element inside the body. And later on, we define H1 color red. So actually, we are redefining a property at the H1 level. And uh, this only applies to these nodes. So who wins? Will be the H1 node red or green? Uh, in this case, it will become red. Why? Because the H1 rule is more specific than the body rule. So there is a set of very quite complicated, let's say, priority mechanism that will tell us uh, which, when a single element is uh, selected by multiple selectors, which one wins. And this is done on a property by property base, on a rule by rule base. But the general rule is that, is that specific wins over generic. Okay? So we can define something for the whole page and then override it at the block level, at the heading level, at the text level, and so on. So we redefine only parts of it. Mm. So it's very powerful uh, in this case because mm. we, are, we can redefine a part of, of, the, of the document uh, by maybe changing only some of the properties. Prob maybe the body rule was also set in the font size or the font face. And at the H1 level, we only redefine the color, and we leave the font size and font face uh, as they were for the whole body. So we can only redefine, you know, surgically what we need. That's why these style sheets are called uh, cascading style sheets. Because you have a sort of a cascade of an overlay of different rules uh, that overwrite the previous one. So you have, you have more general rules and more specific rules, and the more specific ones win, have a higher priority. So the more general rules, those that are just the default rules, are the ones embedded into the browser. Every browser has a set of default styles for every element. Otherwise, the page will become up empty or, or white or blank. So the browser decides that the normal font would be black, and the heading text would be 18 points and so on. That are browser styles. They never win. If you redefine something, the, you are always overriding the browser styles. And what you declare inside your HTML page is in this box, uh, author styles. So the styles defined by the author of the, of the page. So you are inserting into the page um, there could also be some user styles so a user can set some properties into the browser by saying I want the font always bigger so it could define some additional styles that are applied are considered before the other styles but because the users usually don't know they, they, they can do this and don't know how to do that usually this set of user styles is empty so are the styles that your users could customize on top of the browser independently from the website. They never use. So actually you have the browser default styles and the styles that you define in your page. You define many rules, uh, and we will see in a moment that these, these rules 
could be written inside the HTML page, or much, much better, in a separate file. So that's it's cleaner because the, the style sheet will only contain CSS rules. But they are treated in the same way. And uh, for rules uh, of different specificity, so one is larger and the other is smaller, the more specific wins over the more general, like in the, the example that we made before. If I, own, if I have two rules that match at the same level, then the second one, the later one, overrides the first one, the earlier one. Okay? It's reasonable. And uh, on top of all of this, uh, I, could I can also redefine some styles at the element level. So in a specific paragraph, I can change the style of that specific paragraph. Where? In line. So in a property of the element. So I would write P style equal to something. So a style property will apply a rule only to that specific element where we put the style declaration. That's the last resource, and it all swings. Hmm? So this is the, this cascading mechanism. Um, so how do we apply style sheets uh, to a web page? So there are two possibilities. One, I don't recommend it. In the head of the document, we put a style declaration, and inside the style slash style text, uh, we put we write the CSS rule, the rules accord with the CSS syntax. Better, uh, we will also do that uh, using in the head of the document a link element with the syntax. Rel means the relationship type. It's a style sheet. This page is linked with another file through a relationship type of uh, style sheet. That other file is related to this one because it specifies its style sheet. Type uh, equal text CSS, so what is the language that should be interpreted? And then finally, the URL of the file. So we can do that in our, in our web application. Here it is. So we need, of course, to create a style sheet file. We create it in a static directory here because it's just a single file. It doesn't have any templating mechanism associated with that. So new style sheet. Um, Main.css. You want to add the file to git? Yes main.css. So I, we can define that all the text should be blue. For example, but the heading should be Red, for example, will be ugly, I know, but at least it's something that will stand up. Hmm? And maybe also to the body, we can change the background color. Background uh, color. We can make it a very light sort of yellow. Okay, so we are defining some rules, and you see that PyCharms is clever enough to help us completing the syntax and so on. Okay, so, but the, the syntax is always selector, braces, and a list of declarations. Every declaration is a, a key, a property, and a value. This value can be a color name, can be a string, a text, a measurement, a number of pixels, and so on. Uh, okay, we could also want maybe to change the pra all the paragraph text uh, to font uh, family, uh, this one, which is a sensory uh, family, so a cleaner typeface. Hmm? When we list uh, 
this property, font family, lists uh, the fonts to apply, but since we don't know which fonts are installed in the computer of our user, we can list more than one, and the browser will try to match and use the ones that are installed in the computer. And if everything fails, uh, it can use, we always should specify a generic typeface, like serif, sans serif, uh, um, monospace, and so on. There are some predefined ones. But we'll, 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 I, sh I show you a website where you can get all the details, all the information. We don't need to learn them by, by heart now. So this is our website, our style sheet. How can we apply that to our website? Of course, we need to modify the template. So we're going back to the home page. So right now, the style sheet is sitting there, but no page is using it. We need to link uh, the style sheet with the syntax we saw before link style sheet uh, type uh, is uh, CSS and finally the address is uh, is, uh, is a static reference so your for static comma file name is uh, main.css. Yeah, and then we are, sorry, we must close the link element. So let's try to read it all at once. Link, rel style sheet, type text CSS, h reference, hypertext reference, your for static, file name equal main.css. It might work. Let's try it. We start the application. Okay. So you see that the background color has changed. The heading one color is red, the text color is blue, and the text font is changed also. And now if we want to change something, we just need to change the style sheet, uh, and we didn't modify the HTML at all. So the general rule is uh, use HTML for describing the content and just the content. And use the side sheet uh, for giving a nice layout, uh, this is not nice, but uh, giving a layout uh, to the content. So we are separating form from content, which is a good thing, okay? So try to write the HTML as clean as possible, as tidy as possible, and delegate to the CSS, the positioning, the pagination, and the alignment, and all this stuff. So we'll we will try always to avoid using any inline style sheet. We don't know what we could we could uh, change the style here. For example, style equal, and inside the style attribute that I can put everywhere in the HTML. I can specify any CSS property for that specific element. Uh, let's try to avoid it, if possible, because otherwise we are mixing the content and the, uh, the presentation of the page, the layout of the page. Yes? I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Uh, the, the easiest... Uh, so what we saw right now is, a, is the easiest and also the stupidest uh, kind of selector, okay, that is able to select uh, all the elements of the same type, all the P's, all the images, all the H1s, and so on. I, what if I want to do something more? Okay, yeah, I only wanted to point you to this uh, page where you have the list uh, of all the possible properties to apply. Properties are hundreds, okay. They are grouped into the color properties, the font property, the text, text, text declaration fonts are three different categories just for setting the, the font. And inside each of them, there are still uh, subcategories. Uh, so for example, in colors are the colors for the text, uh, all the background colors, position, 
all the colors of the borders around the images, around the text, uh, the shadows. There's also everything about text. Uh, text means uh, paragraphs, formatting of the paragraphs, left aligned, right aligned, central paragraph, and so on. Otherwise, font means uh, the typeface, so the size, the family, the style, bold or not bold, and so on. Huh? And so you, you can control every detail, tables, lists, uh, so you want to customize the bullet, uh, the bullet of the list, uh, you can do that here. You want to count in uh, uh, Romanian numbers instead of Arabic numbers, you can do that. So you have really, as I said, hundreds of different properties, and each one of them has a, a specific page, uh, for example, well, you, in this website, you can have some example, and you can try it yourself, change the, the, um, the, the definition, and see the, the, the output. Okay, so the, these are properties, so you can search what you need. But the, the powerful part is about selectors. So how to select, uh, as he was asking, uh, only a part of the page, only some specific, for example, you know, this, uh, in our example, was uh, a welcome back message. This probably is different from this name label. Mm. You should, you probably want to see it in a different font. So how can I change the style of this paragraph and not that one? I can do that with other selectors. So basically, we have three main uh, families of selectors that can be combined together. The element, the class, and the ID. Element selector is the one that we already used. So in the CSS syntax, we just write an element name. And the element could be body, p, h1, image, whatever you want. And that selector will apply to all the element of that name, of that type, inside the HTML. It's good for applying something page-wise to all the page. If you want to be more specific, you can specify in any HTML element either a class attribute or an ID attribute. And if you have a class attribute, then you have a class CSS selector. So what does it mean? If the, the CSS selector is dot name, it will apply to all the elements, whatever, it could be any element of any type, provided that they have a class declared with that name. Or if you have a hash sign name, hash UU, it will apply to the element in the HTML page that has an ID attribute called UU. independently from the element. So this class, uh, you can define, for example, class equal important. And so you can tag as important many elements, could be one title, could be a paragraph, could be a button. And they will all share the same class important, and they will all get uh, the properties declared in the dot important uh, CC class. Yes? You can, so the question was, can we extend our class and override some properties? Um, a class is a label that you attach onto some element of the page. Every HTML element can have more than one class if you want. So you can define class equal CC space DD space EE FF and so on. You can apply many classes to one element. Or you can apply, the, the also you can define more rules uh, with the same class. So, is there the opposite? Do you say the if there's a conflict, the general rule applies. The more specific rule wins. So if the rules are the same, the, the, the later one wins. If the rules are, we, we'll see how to combine these uh, three selectors, okay? So if you are combining in a more restrictive way, the more restrictive rule wins. So you are, in a way, overriding 
So you are inheriting for general rules, but you can overwrite them at the more specific level. So actually, yes. What is the difference between class and ID? ID is unique. So you can only have one element with a given ID in a page. It's an error, it's an HTML error to have more than one element in the same page with the same ID. So ID is used to pinpoint a specific element, you, that one. Class, uh, as the name implies, uh, is used uh, to usually identify a group of elements, uh, mo possibly more than one, that you want to uh, deal in the same way with, the, with, the, with every element of the group. So all of them should be formatted in the same way. Hmm? So class is uh, for groups of elements that share a common formatting or common application rules. Uh, ID is uh, for marking one specific element and then and applying a rule to only. It's, it's sort of uh, an inline rule because the rule will apply only to that specific element. But it's better because the declaration of the rule is outside the document, even if you are marking the element as, as the direct target of that rule. And nothing prevents that ID to be repeated in many pages. So the, the, the rule says that the ID should be unique inside the HTML page. But if you have another HTML page, so for example, you can have an ID title of the page. No, here, we in our application, we could mark that this H1 is not a generic title, but it is the main title. We assume that the main title, we, we only have one main, main title in every page. We cannot repeat it. Okay? And so we could target this in, within the CSS by using a DH1, or we could use the main title selector. In this case, they are equivalent. But if we have more than one, uh, H1, then the main title will apply only to the first one. Hmm? So it's up to us to make up our combination. By the way, the selectors will combine. So I can have uh, many selectors uh, separated by spaces, and it only means uh, match the second selector when in the scope of the first one. So, um, Table image, table space image as a selector. It will only match images that are included inside the table and not those that are outside the table, for example. Uh, or the selector greater than other selector, you only match the second element if it's a direct child of the first one and not nested into three or four levels of, of elements. And these uh, selectors can be combined. So I can combine an element selector dot class name. So in this case, it, only, it will only match uh, the, this line here at the bottom. Div dot warning will match the div elements with class equal to warning. So if I have a P with class warning, that will not be involved in this rule with this selector. And at the same time, we can do element hash ID. It would be wasted because the ID is unique, so you don't need the element to specify it. Huh? But maybe you want to be extra clear about where you're applying that. So the hash is, is the only one that selects only one, el one element and uh, its uh, subtree, of course. You select the element and everything it contains. So if you are targeting a paragraph, it will be all the text in the paragraph, all the the images into the paragraph and so on. So all the subtree rooted at the element that we select. So it's not true, it's not true that it se selects only one element. It points only to one element and it will select all the subtree rooted at that specific element. So we can combine them. You see uh, there's a rich syntax. It's not even half of that uh, because with CSS3, are, they are adding more and more um, selectors. But the main ones are those ones, are these. Uh, we could also have some pseudo-selectors 
where the state is a sort of a class that changes according to user action. So you could uh, have a text that changes color when the user hovers the mouse on top of it. You define two rules, one for the normal and the other for the hover state. Mm -hmm. And so when the mouse is hovering over a, a text, uh, that, will, that, that rule will, will apply. Mm -hmm. So the rules are applied dynamically also according to user action because uh, elements could change their classes or pseudo classes dynamically. And this will be the work of the browser. Um, so, how to make the best use of this uh, mechanism? Well, first of all, write clean HTML. Always put extra elements. All of them make it easy to point or to identify a portion of the page that has a meaningful content, a sort of a semantic formatting. We should think of the HTML page as a document, not just listing the content, but also structuring the content. So the structure of the content should be explicit in the HTML tag. So try to use uh, uh, headings properly, try to nest uh, properly the list, uh, and so on. And uh, use mark. No? The specific elements uh, with the meaningful class name or meaningful, meaningful IDs. So that if you are, if there is a page, a part of your page that contains navigation bar, for example, ID, navigation bar. If there are some menus, class equal to menu. You decide your own classes, but remember in the HTML page to mark these elements according to the role they have. So it will be easier through CSS to style these elements differently. Also, it will be easier, for example, on mobile devices to make some part of the page disappear. There are some extensions of CSS that match only if you are on a mobile device, on a small screen, and don't match if you are not. So you can make a block of text disappear on a smaller device to save space. Or instead of appearing um, on the same level, they can appear one on top of the other. So you can change the layout also according to this, uh, they call them media queries, a sort of pseudo selector that depend on device size. Mm? That was, they call the responsive design. Mm? Having selector that modify the appearance of a page according to the size of the page. So use uh, correct HTML elements. If you need to make a list, uh, use a list. Don't use a table with many rows. Then you can also visually transform the list into something that looks like a table. But semantically, it's a list. Hmm? And if you need, and you will need it, to have extra uh, grouping of the elements in the page, we can, all, we can have two, we can use, and we'll use a lot, uh, two invisible elements. There are two invisible HTML elements. One is called div and the other is span. These elements uh, are normal HTML elements that do, do nothing. They don't do anything. If you put a div around uh, any block of the page, the page doesn't change. But then you have an element that marks the beginning and, and, the, and the end of a portion of the page. And to that div, uh, you can give it a class and you can style the, uh, the content of that part. Hmm? Uh, so, you can use the div element to mark a, a set of paragraph or a set of uh, tables or lists and so on. It's a block level element, the div. Or you can use uh, the span element to mark a portion of a text. So think of as a div to mark a group of one or more paragraphs. It cuts like this, beginning and the end. The span element cuts like this. Inside the paragraph, uh, the span is normally used inside the paragraph, inside the text, and only marks a portion of the text. So you want this word to be of a different color. So you, you mark a span region around that word. 
So div is a cross paragraph. It in, div includes paragraph. Span is inside paragraph. A span cannot cross more than one paragraph or more than one line. Okay, span is a, for a portion of a line. It's, it's the only difference. And in HTML5, they also have some uh, other useless uh, elements that they are, it's, they are uh, basically, they are different names uh, for the div. You can have a, a div called header, a called nav, a called section, article, a site, footer, and so on. So they are names that you can use. They are shorthand instead of saying uh, div class equal to article, you put them into an article element. By default, it doesn't do anything, but then you can apply CSS style to the article element, and it's cleaner, it's clearer, and so on. Hmm? So in uh, the HTML, is going to this direction, helping you identify what is the role in the page layout, in the pa page functionality, of every group of text uh, that you're writing in the HTML. Okay, so this is the basic, basic mechanism. Uh, we can use it in a very powerful way also to set the layout of the page, set the spacing, the distances, the alignment, and so on. And all these layouts, the layout is a complex uh, stuff, so we, we won't get it right the first time, and it will, we won't get it right today. Every element in the page, there is a layout algorithm in CSS or in, in the browser itself. And the layout algorithm is, uh, is a bottom-up algorithm. So imagine you have a, where is the browser? This word here, for example. This is a content. So a word occupies a space. Because the letters of in it occupy space. An image occupies a space. So every element, every part of the page that, that uses some space on the screen is called a box. A box has a content, and the content is what's inside the box. It cannot be compressed. It depends on the size of the content. So if it's a uh, 12 uh, PT, 12, 12 pixel high letter, it will occupy such a, such a space. But different pieces of content have a distance. So for example, this text, this text, and this text are not, don't touch each other. So actually there is something that are, that are keeping uh, this line, this N, from touching the T. They don't touch. There is some empty space between the two. Okay, so the basic of, uh, of layout is uh, managing the space. Every box is surrounded by a margin. And the CSS algorithm will never put two contents closer to the specified margin, to the bigger of the two margins. You can see it. No, it's not here. Uh, why is that? Hmm? We can see that in every browser we have an advanced tool in the developer section. And uh, in the layout, uh, it will tell you, for example, the, bo the box model about uh, the page. So you can usually there's an inspect here. I want to select this paragraph. It tells me that the content of this paragraph is 900 pixels wide times 25 high. And around it, there is a margin of 16 pixels on the top and 16 on the bottom. These are these two highlighted bars. Why? Because the browser says so. Because the browser style sheet uh, says 
that the margin for text uh, would be 16 pixels. We could change that if we want by redefining our own margin for the paragraph. For, um, what is that? The title, the margin is wider, 21 on the top and 21 in the bottom, because the browser says so. For the image, we don't have any margin on the four sides. Don't look at these numbers in the white area because they are just the distance from the corner of the page. Mm, they're not, uh, and uh, so every element is a content and a margin that keeps the content from touching the adjacent ones in the four directions. But you see that there are an, there's a nesting of, of, of boxes here. So between the content and the margin, there are two other boxes that are called the padding and the border. They are a sort of a triple margin. Around the content, you have three different margins, one inside of the other. What is the difference between the three, padding, border, and margin? Well, the padding shares the background with the content. So the background color of the padding will always be the background color of the, of the content. The margin shares the background color of the background of the container element. So the background, the margin space will appear to belong to the background. The margin has the same color as the background. The padding has the same color as the content. And the border can have a color of, of its own. So if you want to draw, draw a border, you should draw something in a color which is different from the color of the element and different from the color of the background, of course. So the border is usually a thin line or a dashed line or something like that that goes around the element in a different color to make it visible. So you can create and space all the elements as you like by playing with these values. And the border, of course, has only not just the size, so if I increase the border here, or I can also play with these values. No, it doesn't remember. Okay, Inter Explorer is not clever enough. Chrome will remember that. But we, we can we can see and play with this uh, size to, to change the layout. And of course, we then we need them to go back to the CSS and make to make the change part permanent because right now we are just seeing the, the result. And so. We have a, a complex uh, layout algorithm that takes into account uh, all the content and all the defined page in border margin sizes to position the elements. And later, we'll apply the colors. OK, we, are, we have some examples that we can skip. Uh, so in our web page, uh, from the HTML point of view, is a tree of elements. But from a, the layout point of view, is a linear ser series of boxes. Of course, the content of a box can be another box. If I have a div, it has its own box. The div contains three paragraphs. Every paragraph has a different box. We first define the size of the box of the paragraph, and then we put them together so that we can define the content of the div. From the content of the div, we will apply the padding, the border, and the margin. And so we have a, a wider box for the div. And if this div is inside an, a, a bigger div, we do the same from the bottom to the root element of the body of the page. Hmm? And uh, what do we do with these boxes? We can align boxes in two ways. One side to the other, like we did uh, with the image and this text. They are in a left to right positioning, in an inline positioning, one after the other in the right direction. Or one below the other. Paragraph, another paragraph, another paragraph. So there are some elements that naturally use an inline positioning, left to right, and when the, the, the line is finished, they wrap at the beginning of the next. 
So image and text go in line. Image, sorry, text, input and button go in line. Paragraphs go onto a new line. So they are block elements. So block elements align in the vertical sense. Inline elements align, do align in the horizontal sense. So there are actually two different layout algorithms. First, you lay out horizontally. Then when you find a block element, uh, you cut a line and start again. You cut a new line and start again from the beginning. This is the normal fo flow algorithm. Left to right, top to bottom. There are exceptions, of course, because maybe, so you have to say that you have block level e elements like div, like p, like h1, and inline elements, fun, image, input, table, strangely enough, is an inline element. Huh? You can, of course, change this behavior with CSS styles, but it's not a good idea to do that. And uh, by changing the display property. I want it to display in block or I want it to display in line. But uh, you can instruct the browser to override this normal rule. Okay, this is the normal flow, positioning flow, but this block should be moved away. And there are at least two different rules. Uh, let's not look at the other one because I don't like it. It's uh, called the relative positioning or the absolute positioning. In the relative position, is you let the browser lay out the, the boxes in a normal way, and then you take a box and move it by a given amount of space in some direction. So you can, it could, the final position is relative to the position where it would have been if we didn't apply the rule. The other blocks, boxes are not affected. So if the initial box occupied the space initially, then that space would be empty. Otherwise, the absolute positioning changes because it's different because it will lay out all the other elements without the one that is absolutely positioned. So if you have a position absolute box, initially the layout algorithm will not consider it will lay out only the other ones so you don't, have, you don't have any space in between and later it will start positioning from the from the beginning of the containing box uh, these elements into new position hmm? so these are for of course for for different reasons hmm? and uh, on top of this, there is another layout property which is called floating. Floating means uh, putting an element to the extreme left or to the extreme right. So like you want, would you like to see a picture on the side of, a, of an article or the menu with, plo with always plus left and the content will run on the right of it and so on. You can imagine that the combination of uh, Inline versus block, relative versus absolute, floating versus clear, clear creates some interesting combination, let's say. So it's very complicated to do, the, to do the right thing. I want a website with three columns in the middle, but a main line, a main heading with the span of the whole page and the news part on the bottom right that only takes a couple of columns. Okay, it's easy to draw. It's not easy to find the right uh, you know, uh, CSS properties to assign to the different divs, especially if you take into account that this, the, the browser can change uh, size, uh, and so you don't know actually how many pixels you have. So the, the good part is that uh, we don't need uh, to die into all these details here because we're going to use uh, something simpler. So because uh, since CSS is so complex, 
it's not complex in by by itself as an idea but if you want to reach some advanced result uh, you need really to write a lot of rules so people started to create a framework a css framework is a, a group of many rules that apply that are defined for you rules that mimic uh, and say good practices in web development for example the guys at twitter they developed their own css styles and then they made them public they published the so-called bootstrap framework which is actually derived from the internal css rules used by the twitter application you have a set of css rules a css a set of css rules doesn't do anything unless you put some classes in your elements and these classes will pull the rules towards them. So you have the rules defined. If you want to change the appearance of an element, you put a class into the div, into the button, into the input. And of course, you need, you need to learn the classes. So instead of learning all the detailed properties of the C at the CSS level, we are learning the um, classes that are defined uh, by this framework there are more than one the most famous one is bootstrap a bootstrap is just a set of css uh, rules uh, at the address get to bootstrap.com and in order to use bootstrap you just need to include uh, these three links there are two css one is the basic set of rules uh, the second is the the theme because it can be customized in different ways uh, and the third one is a bit of javascript that is needed by the by some more advanced functionality but if you paste this in your page you are automatically applying uh, bootstrap so let's try to see what changes we love you main.css where we don't use a we don't want to use you anymore. So we remove the reference to that. And we call the Bootstrap framework in our home page. So if I restart it and I reload it. Something happened, but not much. But something happened. You see that the, the font is different. It's, it's leaner. It's cleaner. It's more modern, if you like. It's not a good-looking page because you see that it, it doesn't have any left margin. Well, actually, we are not using Bootstrap correctly in this command. But we see that it's being applied. Uh, Bootstrap defines the... Uh, sorry a set of classes to, where is that? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, a set of classes that you can use in your, in your body. It only, why doesn't it tell that? Okay. But it requires to be applied uh, nicely. It requires, what is that? all the main content to be included in a div called uh, with class container actually there are two different type of containers it's one is called container and the other is called container fluid container is a, is a fixed white and fluid in, adapts to the size of the browser so depending on what kind of layout you are wanting you want to create uh, you should uh, create the boundary for your application. So in our case, uh, it doesn't look like because we didn't specify the container of the page. So the container should be around all the content of the page. Div, class, container. And then we close the div before the end of the body. So if we do this, our application will position itself more nicely in the center of the screen. 
And then we can go on applying styles uh, by just applying the classes to the elements that we want to change. So instead of defining rules that should apply to elements, the rules are already there, are already defined, are so complex that we don't want to see them. We only want to identify the elements to which we don't we want them to be applied. And you can find all the rules that you need in two sections here. In the Bootstrap website, there is this CSS page that lists uh, all the styles uh, that you can apply. For example, okay, I make it a bit smaller so that you see that on the right there is no menu here. If I make it smaller, the menu will appear. So this is an example of the application of the, of the Bootstrap. It says that this menu should be on the right, uh, but it only should uh, uh, appear on medium or large screens and not on small screens. We see how, how to do that. And uh, all the um, if you if you want, for example, to modify the text, you go to typography, and it will tell you. Okay, the, the body is normal. You want to make a, a paragraph standing out, you can use this class lead. So the leading text of an article. You want to highlight some text, you can use mark. You want to delete some text, you can use delete, delete, and so on. So for the text part. Or, so, in, under typography. You want to customize buttons. You can have buttons, uh, gray buttons, or colored buttons. You see that these buttons are nicer than the one we have. The button we have is square and gray, oldish looking. These are nicer looking. They are a bit, uh, they can align themselves. Just, I just have to add a, a class button, button default style, button default. These two classes will change the appearance of the button. Or if you want uh, to make a blue button, it will be button primary. Or a green is a button success. Uh, an orange is a button warning, and so on. You can make them of, the, of different sizes. How? By applying a new class. So you're adding classes as you want to modify the property of the element. The same for forms. This form is actually, what is that? Not very nice looking with a button which is taller than the text area. This is what the browser does, it's not my fault. And the alignment of the name and all the text uh, are not centered. So it doesn't look so, it doesn't look right visually. And so there is a bootstrap section for getting forms right. You have two types of forms, the vertical form, like this, and how to get it, you define a sort of a, a set of form groups. Every form group is a label and a, an input, label and input. Group number one, group number two, first group, second group. And each group is aligned correctly, the label is positioned and so on. Or you can define an inline form where the label and the input are side by side instead of uh, having occupying the full white of the page. How to do that? You just, uh, you, with the same form group uh, syntax, but in the form element, you add the class form inline. They will transform all the layout of the other elements. So you don't have to put P anymore to make a new line. You just use the elements and the form group uh, and forming line properties to make them vertically stacked or left to right aligned. And also you can alight, you know, you, you, it gives a border to the form when the cursor is inside. All the small visual details that we take for granted today that are hard to do because you, you need to set up a lot of property, you know, the rounded borders, the, the, uh, the background, the animation where the color appears gradually in a split second 
but it makes it nicer. It costs a lot of rules, but uh, we are, they are already defined for us, okay? So basically, uh, the same is uh, for tables. No, and the, the, H, the basic HTML table is ugly to say the best. In CSS, you just add a CSS equal to table and you get the default bootstrap style for the table and you can do better, like uh, striping rows. I don't know if you see them, they are different shades of gray. Borders, you can have borders or not, as you like, uh, and so on. Hmm? So, you can change the background, the rows. So, it's a very, cool. we need to understand the mechanism of CSS, but when, when we are using a CSS framework, we rarely need uh, to write a CSS rule by ourselves. Uh, we just use uh, classes that have been defined at the framework level. Okay? So, today we don't have uh, any more time, but next time, we see an extension of Flask that will uh, use Bootstrap uh, or make uh, easier to insert Bootstrap into our pages, our Flask application. So we, we, don't, we will not even need uh, to paste all of this. Uh, we see how to extend Flask with a plugin, with a Flask extension, which is, that is called Flask Bootstrap, that will do all the boring work for us and will apply it automatically to all the web pages. So everything will be very s much simpler to write and cleaner to write and will look much better on the HTML side. So at that point, we'll have the best of the two worlds. Easy to write and nice look to see. Today, we are done. Thank you.